besides me in the last two months as a guest of the Chinese Cyberspace Administration? No? Wow, okay, all right. So CypherCon, here we are. I'm going to talk, as I mentioned, about Chinese hackers and cyber sovereignty. If you have a question, what's that? I don't understand your, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> I know that guy, actually. I think I do, anyway. All right, if you have questions or if I use an acronym that you're not familiar with, then please raise your pretty little hand and I'll answer to the best of my abilities. I do not have all the answers. I'm always in the learning mode. You're going to see stuff that I haven't shown any other audience simply because this stuff evolves quite frequently. All right, you all have your little CypherCon daily job there? All right, let's move on, shall we? Every one of you has already been hacked by the Chinese, guarantee it. There's your little agenda. Now, for those of you that have not been to China, this is the way they view the world. And if you know what Zhong means, which is this character right here, that means middle. The other one is Guo, which is the king or the queen and their city surrounded by four borders. They are the middle kingdom. Everything else is subservient to them, especially everyone in this room. You're considered foreigners, not even Americans, and that's the way they deal with it. So. Who's heard of unrestricted warfare before? You've heard of it? You have not. This is the Chinese military writing that came out in 1991. I had the fortunate opportunity to meet those two authors in Beijing last fall. So the very Chinese military that I'm writing about, I finally get a chance to meet them. It's interesting because there was a communist official there sitting across the table from me. And he says, Bill, we know who you are. We know the books you've written. And I said, oh, dear, this could be a problem, couldn't it? And he says, well, we appreciate what you're doing. And I stopped him. I said, am I going to have trouble getting out of Chang'an Airport on Friday? He puts down his pen and he says, nah, we think we'll let you go this time. <laughs> true story. True story. All right. So this is the book that launched my second career. My first career was 20, almost 30 years in the U.S. Marine Corps. I wrote this book in 2010 without divulging any classified information. By the way, this is an unclassified brief. So if you're looking for classified, I'm not going to share that with you tonight. Am I credentialed? Yes, I am. How many people hold clearances in here? You guys won't get the good stuff tonight. You'll have to read it somewhere else. Yep. So I went ahead and wrote three other books. All of these. One of these I was told to take down by our government, so you will not find it on Amazon anymore. I understand that it's going for about 10,000 British pounds in the UK. You can guess which one it is. Yes, take a picture and then if you want the manuscript, maybe I'll send it to you. So I wrote this latest one and I, the person that can give me pause with a question tonight will walk home with this. Yes, it is chopped with my Chinese chop and then I'll sign it in Chinese for you and then you can figure out what it says. The ultimate cipher, yes? All right. So, Chinese cybercrime. Everyone in this room has been hacked. Most of you are hackers, yes? You're not going to admit that, and I'm not with federal law enforcement. But if you did, you'd be arrested, wouldn't you? Nobody's shaking their head, are they? Oh, dear. All right. We all know that everybody is being hacked currently, aren't they? All right. So, an adversary taxonomy. These are the people that are out there in cyberspace from a nation-state perspective. Everything from nation-states during peacetime and wartime as we're seeing with DOD and ISIL in the Middle East, all the way down to rogue collectives like the now defunct Russian Business Network and everything in between. And these are their technologies, tactics, and protocols that they use to come after what they want. Remember, you can ask questions anytime. You can tell that I'm not shy, yes? All right, somebody's smiling, that's good. Okay, don't be afraid of me, please. If I ask you to do push-ups, I'll do them with you. No problem, all right. So let's go to Communist China. Make no mistake, they are indeed still the Communist People's Republic of China. Now what's interesting, on the 1st of July 2015, they announced their new national security law. And they copied the United States and said, if you are a foreigner, meaning not Chinese, you can't bring your technology in without us inspecting it first, period. They also on that same day, the Politburo, 
announced a draft cybersecurity law. And in, what's really interesting is they went out to the Chinese public and said, give us your comments. Now, how often does that happen in the Communist Party? I know, it's like watching an episode of Seinfeld. True story. All right, so current China. Who remembers the Boxer Rebellion? Okay, a few cultured people. Well, back in the 1900s, there were foreign powers, eight nations precisely, and they set up legations in Beijing. And the boxers said, we're not going to allow these foreigners to occupy our territory. We're going to go fight them in an asymmetric type of guerrilla warfare. This is currently what's happening in their view in the Internet today. And what you have is a Communist Party that looks at their network as national sovereign space. Now, if you know your history with the US DOD, which we'll touch on here in a second, if you violate that national cyberspace of China, they reserve the right to come at you with all force of the military. They'll do it. They will. What's interesting now is that that Boxer Rebellion of the 1900s has become the binary rebellion of the 21st century. And I'm going to give you some interesting facts here as we go through this. Yes, please. In what terms? No. If you violate the cyberspace, gentlemen's question was, do they make a distinction between private individuals and nation states? No, they do not. You violate that Chinese cyberspace, they will come after you with the full measure of any military effectiveness they can, including kinetic weapons. Huh? <laughs> You're screwed, buddy. <laughs> All right. This is a good point, though. The gentleman makes a great point, because right now the Chinese regard the United States as the major antagonist when it comes to the cyber domain, not the other way around. So when you read those things in the headlines, it's just drivel. Now, the binary revolution as we enter it, you must now know that the Chinese military has announced that their cyber forces are within the strategic rocket forces and the support forces. This just happened about a month and a half ago. So they have come out and said, indeed, they've reorganized the military from seven military regional commands down to four. And within those four is the cyber command that you see up here. Now, within that, as I mentioned, is they want to make sure that everyone, including internal and external forces around China, observe the national sovereignty of their networks. Believe me, it is still a fragmented society. So, who remembers Mao Zedong? In 1949, what was he doing? Besides that, he did that in 47, actually. Yes, sir, he did. And who did he do it with? He did it with Japanese guerrillas, is what he did it with. And this is a big historical issue. But what he was telling his military commanders in the field is that you will deceive the enemy, in this case Chiang Kai-shek's troops, with every force that you possibly can so that we can fix them in place and destroy them. Information warfare at its earliest form within China. Who has seen this before? Anybody in the military? What is it? It's the announcement of Cyber Command in 2009 when the US military militarizes a area of operations or a geography Every other country on the planet knows that we're going to be coming after what's ever in that. In this case, the rest of the world, including the Chinese, said, we must now react to the United States. We will form our own cyber command, but we'll call it Informization Command in 2010. At that time, President Hu Jintao gathered his five generals and said, gentlemen, create for me a cyber command to defend our country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. For those in the military, if I tell you to set up a defensive position, what's your next natural act going to be? The only people that can answer that have answered this correctly were Marines, so I don't expect to answer it if you're not a Marine. And what else? He said, continue to improve the position, and what else? What? Safe sock. What is that? Prepare for an offense, right? Well, you're already going to do that in a defensive position. What he, Hu Jintao wanted a defensive position set up by the Chinese military, but if you tell anybody in any military around the world to set up a defensive position, the next natural act is going to be prepare offensive combat. The Chinese view at this time 
was that the United States was very much the enemy. If we set up militarization of the cyber war, cyber sphere, if you look at this little picture right here of their version of SC Magazine, this is the shape of a kinetic device. Look at the words inside that. You have all those acronyms and words that we now know to be true. This was in 2011. This Chinese perspective was written by academics, civilians, titans of industry inside China, communists, and of course, the Chinese military. The consistent theme was we must prepare to defend China against all this aggression from the United States. And indeed, the way the Chinese look at the U.S. is they are the best hackers on the planet. That's all of you in the room, by the way, not the other way around. And the digital attack perspective, if you've been to this little resource out on the web, you can basically pinpoint a country and take a look at the different types of inbound and outbound traffic based on an attack perspective. Certainly you've all seen this resource, yes? Probably in the binary format, I'm sure, which is great. Let's talk about hackers. These two acronyms, these two characters, sorry, hey means black, k means guest. Put those together and you get hey k or hacker, dark guest. That's what all of you are referred to as in the Chinese vernacular. So who is China? Make no mistake about it, it is the Communist Party. It is the state and the military, three entities only. Under the current president, Xi Jinping, he is putting a tight noose around the military, saying you cannot do anything unless I give you the order to do that, including cyberspace. The four groups of hackers inside China remain the same. Communist Party, military, state-owned enterprises, and the hackers. I've met every one of these. Oh, full disclosure. Just so you're all aware, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, yes, I do belong to a Chinese military think tank as a visiting scholar. So I've gone all the way up the river. Yes. Interesting, no? Yes. So let's talk briefly about each one of these. You've heard of the Golden Shield Project. I would posit this to you. If they are controlling the internet space inside China, how are hackers able to get out unless they are not sponsored by the government? Yes? Good point. A young man in Ohio brought that up to me in about 2010, so I give credit to him. The gentleman's name was Aaron Lafferty. If you're recording this, he'll be happy to get that little accolade. And then, of course, there was the Green Dam Project. Anybody heard about that? This is where any computer sold inside China would have at the kernel level of the machine. It would look for naughty words. It was designed primarily to protect children against pornographic images. And what happened was is the Communist Party would start to do PowerPoints or Excel spreadsheets and they had the wrong series of characters, the computer would shut down. So this program was dismissed after several months. So not everything works in the, in the kingdom. 2010, as I mentioned, then Hu Jintao codified it with informization base. Xi Jinping, as you'll learn here, wants to make sure that the freedom of search is indeed controlled inside China. Believe me, you cannot get Yahoo you can't get Yahoo, you can't get Google, Facebook, Twitter, all of those Western social medias are not welcome in China. The only way you do that is to hop the Great Wall with a VPN. If you get caught as a foreigner using a VPN, you can be subject to arrest. Interesting, yes? Do you guys want me to turn on the Wi-Fi so you can search this machine that was in China? Scan it? We'll do that after this and I'll set it over there and you can poke around on it if you'd like. Okay. Hu Jintao and now Xi Jinping wanted to realize the economic power of the internet, but they want to also make it pure. In this case, under the current law, if you search anything pornographic, anything that is Falun Gong related, their religion, anything that is anti-communist in its rhetoric, you will be arrested. When you go to current China as a foreigner, you must register your passport, give them a copy of it, and it is registered to the MAC address of your machine. Every hotel room has its own hotspot that they control. So everything you do, they watch. It's kind of Orwellian a little bit. So 2015, as I mentioned before, it gave the People's Liberation Army, the military inside China, the responsibility to begin preparing to actually defend the borders of China's internet as if it were sovereign territory. What's interesting is now they're using the military inside China, unlike here, to protect the citizens of the country. It does not happen here in the United States. If you're a commercial enterprise here, what happens? Folks like you get paid to protect the enterprise, right? 
I won't go into a posse comitatus or Title 10 of the U.S. Code for right now, unless you ask me that. So let's take a look at the Chinese military. This is interesting because this URL, Ministry of Defense, actually depicted their cyberspace, their cyber warriors, in 2012. Since I have given this presentation to, for example, NATO and other folks around D.C., this page has been removed from the Internet. You get a little 404 Chinese error saying it's not available anymore. What is interesting within the Chinese military is they regard the use of information warfare as a combat component, meaning they're starting to look at ways to use weapons in cyberspace to go after those folks that would hack them. Now, <clears throat> who's heard of Sun Tzu? How many of you have the art of war? Keep your hands up. And I'm talking about the true art of war, not this bullshit network art of war and all that other stuff. The true version. Who's, who has that? Okay. Those are the lucky people. The rest of you that don't have it, get a copy of it and read it. Because the Chinese military is still reading this. In fact, the first book I wrote, I equated modern technology with some of Sun Tzu's precepts and laws of war. If you like the art of war, you like his great-grandson, Sun Ping. It's an even better book. Ralph D. Sawyer writes fabulous stuff on him. And then, of course, called Military Methods. In 1995, Major General Wang Pufeng actually came out and said that the Chinese military needed to start thinking about the Internet as a battle space. If you were in the U.S. military in 1995, what were we doing? Bosnia, other things around the globe, yes. We weren't thinking about the Internet, were we? We didn't even know what information assurance was, did we? Not until about 2011. They were thinking about it in the Chinese military as a way of controlling, fixing in place an adversary. And then, of course, I mentioned War Without Limits, and my good friends, General Chiao Liang and Wang Xiao Sui that I met wrote Unrestricted Warfare, War Without Limits. And then in 2002, Major General Tai Ching Min, yes, sir. It's where they say it is. Now, well, wait, can you hold all questions on that till the end? Okay, and while I do that, write this down. This young man's writing up in the front. One belt, one road. Write down one belt, one road. Has anybody heard of this strategy before? Wow. That's all right, nobody in DC's heard of it either, which would really scare you. I mean, really. One belt, one road, search for it. I'll give you the, the graduate here in a second. So 2010, as I mentioned, some of these generals have remained in service. These are the guys that created their cyberspace in 2010 in response to the United States DOD militarizing cyberspace. What's interesting about this that you need to know, that each one of these generals is pure Han Chinese. They're all card-carrying communist members, they're all technologists, and they're all, at the end of the day, Chinese meaning they are not Tibetan, they're not Uyghurs, they're certainly not foreigners. Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao knew that he could trust these military officers to make those decisions when it was necessary if faced with confrontation. They could not be bought. I see some young, young ladies uh, shaking their head yes when I said Uyghurs and Tibetans. Yes. Still is. Yep. Yes. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I wouldn't equate it that way, but a Han Chinese, if you've ever met one, and the PLA is full of them, their skin is actually yellow. It's wax-like. And if you have studied the Korean War, they talked about the yellow hordes coming north. They were talking about the Chinese military coming and fighting the U.S. Army and the Marines during the Korean conflict. That's where that comes from. I mean, it goes back to the mandarins of the 500 you know, B.C. or earlier, but that gives you an idea of how long that legacy has been around. So this guy in 1998 is, sorry, 88, is actually one of the secret founding fathers of information warfare inside China. He has served in the military, but now he's like a military advisor. What's interesting is he has written several books on how the Chinese military should use information warfare. And Wei Jin Cheng, if you've not seen these names before, you should be familiar with them. Because these are who the Chinese military is studying in terms of using a keyboard and a mouse and any sort of network computer system in order to fix an enemy in place and defeat them. Where they say the borders are, sir, not where you determine or think they might be. 
Could be in your backyard. Yes? And then we have Dai Xu, who's with the Air Force inside China, talking about theorizing of using space warfare. And if you look on my blog, you'll see the MOD with inside China announced something about using the space satellite systems to take out adversary satellites so they can control that digitized environment as well. Very interesting. Now, somebody out in the cyberspace here in the United States did not believe that I actually found this. But here you have it. So how, do, how does the PLA plus it up? We know the U.S. military is admitting overweight sailors, right, to become hackers. The Chinese come out with an AK-74 and say, sir, if you do not attack for us, you have two choices. We will shoot you or you can hack for us. So they have a voluntold army of hackers that they can plus up at any time. Have I met these? You'll find out here in a second. So, remember I mentioned War Without Limits? Yes, I have an autographed copy by these guys. What's interesting about these two generals is that they talked about asymmetric warfare in the internet domain, deterring war rather than focusing on it. Because if anybody, who's been, to, who's been in combat here besides me? We don't ever want to go back, do we? Huh? You do? Wow, you must not be married then, right? Not yet. It's a different perspective. It point is, it's not climate controlled, is it? It's not carpeted, is it? Generally, you can't see your family at the end of a mission, right? Nobody that's been to war, if they're sane, wants to go back. Trust me on that. I didn't say he wasn't. It's all good. So, combat under development of information conditions. These two generals at a National Defense University inside China actually got on TV and they said they are teaching the PLA cadre how to hack the enemy, meaning through information operations, create conditions for them so that the enemy believes that they have already been invaded or taken over, and then invade them. What country does that sound like besides the United States? Well, not Canada. In the, in the hacking world, yes, sir, Russia, exactly, and the Ukraine. Anybody been here to the uh, NATO Cyber Center? Wow. You should go. Come with me next month. You can be my guest. Fascinating stuff. What's that? Got to have a clearance. Got to have served your military, served your country in the military. Sorry. It's a steep price. All right. Focus cyber operations by the Chinese military. This is interesting, folks. 2012, Xi Jinping, actually Hu Jintao came out and said he wanted the entire military within China, digitized by 2025. Hu Jintao had given this edict, and Xi Jinping has accelerated this. So these cyber operations, as we've now seen with the Strategic Rocket Force, and the cyber forces have come to a head. This is one of those slides that you have not seen, or anyone really has seen. This is their version of the NSA. I found it by mistake. That URL, if you go to the bottom there, please go on a safe machine does not exist anymore. They have removed it from the internet. Somehow I stumbled on it and now it's, it's gone, but there you go. This is an interesting piece. Somebody in DC came out and said that they had this book translated just last year. And I wrote a piece and I said, well that's funny because I bought it on Amazon three years ago in English. And if you don't understand the implications of that, then you need to sit down and shut up. Because what the Chinese were doing is they are saying, we've got military strategy out here, we want you to read it and understand what we're doing. So be careful what you read in the headlines because it's not always true. Yes? Of course it is. We all watch Fox. Yes, sir? Exactly. Precisely. Good question. Good point. The fact that they put it on English Amazon in English is interesting. They want to tell us what they're doing. Deceptive ops or not, doesn't matter. It's out there. 2015, they're talking about big data in the Chinese military and how to focus and emphasize that in terms of defeating an enemy. And the cyber preparations have continued. They announced the schools that are actually academies inside China, of which there are hundreds, which they have cadre, where they are teaching the military how to be hackers. Interesting. Am I moving too fast? No? What? Good pace? All right. 
This guy, this general right here, he got up and his actual rhetoric, if you look at it historically, is very anti-American. It's definitely anti-Chinese. And he said that China must be prepared to win all wars, including information wars, at all costs. Who's heard of Sinomach? S-I-N-O-M-A-C-H. Jot it down and Google it while we're sitting here. S-I-N-O-M-A-C-H. You want me to spell it phonetically? Sierra Indian November Oscar Mike Alpha Charlie Hotel. Sinomac. Very nice. So the Chinese military is definitely doing this. They are now looking at using cyber forces to combat terrorism. We talked about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. That's their biggest source of ISIL fighters. They want to make sure they can defeat them in cyberspace as well. And then in 2016, we're talking about winning the information warfare. They're putting out PSYOP types of posters that say they, the Chinese military, have our hacker cadre that no one in the United States can touch from a military perspective. Have you heard that in the headlines yet? No, you have not. You've heard it here. Lovely, yes? Don't, now on the way home, do not stop at Walmart and buy ammunition and water. Don't do it. You know why? Because you'd be classified by D, uh, DHS as a terrorist. True? Yes? Well, you're looking at me like it's puzzled. Think I'm kidding me? Yeah, I'm kidding you, I'm not. It's true. All right. So, we talked about the strategic rocket forces being prepared. Here's the flag unfurling of the new forces by President Xi Jinping. The officers are standing, you've got the Chinese and the English version, totally different story. Stories are totally different. On the right side, uh, sorry, your right, left, my right, English version, just talks about a new command that's being established. My right, your right, is talking about the way the Chinese will use cyber and the military to make sure that they can defend China. Interesting. This slide you will not, I guarantee you, see in the newspapers unless somebody takes a picture of it. These are the commanders of those new rocket forces, unless you can read Chinese, which is nobody in this room. But that's the new leaders of the military strategic rocket forces inside China. And their English names. <clears throat> yes, take a picture. There you go. Very nice. What's interesting is, who's heard of the second artillery and the second rocket forces inside China? Some of you have. And what does that represent to you? Hackers, yes? They're no longer around. They've been renamed the Strategic Rocket Forces and the Support Forces as the new cyber emphasis of the PLA. And there's a force laydown. That's where all those forces are. Notice the map is Baidu generated inside from China. Not from here. That's where all those units are. That's where the cyber forces are inside China. That's, uh, geez. Vietnam, down there, yeah. But they are good friends with the Malaysians, by the way, and the Indonesians. All right, so they got rid of all, they reorganized the military. This is another one of those slides that you will not see in the news. There is a new command out there called 5PLA. This is where the cyber emphasis is. Is anybody in, in the information world here? I won't use the term, in, in term intelligence because that's insulting. <laughs> This is where the cyber forces are reconstituted inside, specifically the Chinese military. Awesome stuff, yes? All right. This guy was promoted from a full bird colonel in the Chinese PLA to becoming a one-star general. He now trains the Chinese military cadre how to hack. Interesting stuff. Has this been in the Western press? No, it has not. Why? Not paying attention, don't speak Chinese, don't care, right? Okay, now you're getting a dose of it. All right. This is interesting because this talks about specifically the way that attack positions will be created under the new 5 PLA. It doesn't give you the nitinoid technical details, but it gives you from a strategic perspective the doctrine that they're espousing within Beijing and Zhonghan Nai. Have you heard of that term before? Zhonghan Nai is their version of the Pentagon. If you say that inside China, everyone in the room will look at you and say, where did you learn that? <laughs> so be careful. All right. This is the new commander of the 16th PLA. This is the guy that's going to be in charge, the general that's going to be in charge of all the cyber forces. You will not see this anywhere but here. 
Right, wrong, or indifferent, there it is. Good stuff. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, what else? What else? I heard DOD. What else? What else? Where's the location? Xiangang. Why are DOD login credentials sitting on a server in Hong Kong? Why? Who knows Cryptia? That's your source. Enough said. All right. Third group of state-owned enterprises. I'll blast through these quickly. The thing that you need to know about state-owned enterprises, these are the companies. They're the ones responsible for the economy going in the to toilet currently. They do not have an ability to create indigenous intellectual property. They have to go and steal it. That's why we've heard about cyber theft. That's where these companies come in. One of the most interesting ones, of course, that has led to this now is that the Chinese are looking at any foreign company, specifically American, has an NSA backdoor built into it. So it's not allowed inside China. That's the way they view that. The other part of that is a small little company called Huawei in Shenzhen, Guangzhou province. Mike Rogers, whose face there you see, basically banished them from doing any sort of business within the military complex inside the United States. If you look at my first book and you look at the optical, it's the layer two co connectivity for the defense intelligence base, it rides on Huawei gear. Why does it ride on Huawei? It was lowest bid at the time. Interesting. You've heard of Light Reading Magazine? Google it, you will find it for yourself, or buy my book, but nevertheless, you'll see it. Who's heard of that Canadian company called Nortel? 2001, they sign up for a nice little business arrangement with a Chinese company. The engineers and hackers in their company, that's all of you, we're talking to the executives and say, hey, we're seeing our intellectual property in markets that we're not yet in without our mark on it. Nortel, it says like Huawei and ZTE. Executives say, don't worry about it. You're thinking about it too much like you usually do. We've got it under control. We've got a joint venture. Go back and go to your computer and don't worry about it. Five years later, Nortel's economic position in the world ceased to exist because their economic position had been eroded by those intellectual property that had been taken during the JV. They ceased to becoming a Canadian company. A year later, the, Chinese, the Canadian intelligence world issued a super secret memo saying watch out for the cyber espionage from China. That was a joke. Okay. Now you've heard about the companies inside the United States that have been hacked. There are numerous. DuPont, this is just a small list. The Chinese are looking at this too. And if you remember those five PLA officers that were put on an FBI most wanted poster, that did not do well for the relations with the United States and with China, vice versa. Because what do we, who do we put on most wanted posters, usually? Murderers, terrorists, people that we just as soon shoot if we saw. Here we're putting Chinese military officers on a most wanted poster because they hacked. Hacking in China is not illegal if it's endorsed by the government. If you hack in an unauthorized way, you will be arrested. Food for thought. All right. The last group is the dark guests. These are the interesting folks. These are the hackers. That would be some of you with your skills and abilities. They primarily were mainly focused on preserving the nationalistic identity of China in cyberspace. You look at the missile, the Aaron Tow missile, Tow, JDAM, that was landed on the Yugoslavian embassy during the Bosnian conflict, that young man that was there. How does a precision guided munition land on a Chinese embassy? The hackers wanted to know this in China. So they hacked the White House and some other entities. And that, essentially, in 2001, is how this hacker war started. Now, this is the face of today's Chinese hackers. This is interesting, because you can see my smiley little bead up there, my face, holding my book. This was at Hackers in Taiwan. So I meet these three hackers. You've got Claude Xiao and this guy, Tomb Keeper. You maybe have run into them on the internet. These two guys were so angry. And they said in Chinese, and they didn't think I could hear them, they said, oh, this is the guy that wrote that book. And I said, you mean this book? And he's like, oh, yeah, we have several copies. And I said, well, I understand that my book was banned by your government. And he said, well, we still managed to get several copies of it. 
Now, who's heard of Wan Tao? Very famous Chinese hacker. This guy right here, he's like, I didn't receive a copy of this. Claude looks at him and says, you know why you didn't receive a copy. You work for IBM. You are no longer one of us. Because he worked for a foreign company, is no longer part of the inside circle inside China. Interestingly, this fellow right here, Tomb Keeper, underneath that, that's why he's got it covered up, was the Eagle Globe and Anchor. If you know what the Eagle Globe and Anchor is, I told him to turn that shirt inside out. Because I said, you look, see this right on my tie clasp? That's my Marine Corps. Last time I checked, we didn't take hackers from China. Please turn it inside out. He was wearing a copied version of a shirt. Hilarious. Can't make this stuff up. What hackers do, which I go into great detail in this book, is significant. They look for vulnerable systems. They do not go after generally capital like the Russians do. They go after ideas based on targeted methodologies from the PLA. Now, E do E B. Sir, you asked that question about where their borders are. The one belt, one road strategy is something you need to know because I'll be retired again, hopefully. What they are doing is they are building an economic silk road that includes maritime and a cyber highway. Each one of these foreign locations will have a PLA garrison. Who's heard of Djibouti? The Chinese are building a giant military base there right now. In these foreign military bases are going to be PLA cyber centers. That, sir, is where the border of their network will be. Oh, and by the way, if you use China Netcom or China Telecom, you're already on their sovereign territory. You just don't know it yet. It's very pervasive. So here are my conclusions. I have taken down the naughty ones because people just didn't believe me anymore. So if you want me to espouse you with those because nobody seems to be able to challenge, and I would hope that in this audience you would, here they are from a simple milk toast PC version. Bottom line is, if you cannot read Chinese, you will be violated by them every time. Some of you are probably wanting and waiting for me to say the two-bit binary, right? What is that? Well, what's English? Single byte, right? UTF-8? Mandarin is UTF-16, two-byte binary. If you code in C or C++ using Mandarin, any signature-based, behavioral-based, or anomaly-based system is not going to detect it. Somebody challenge me, please. You guys of all people, yes? Oh, shit. Wow. Oh dear. Oh boy. Wow. Well, I'll just scamper back to Minneapolis and go somewhere else then if I'm not going to be challenged in this audience. Holy shit. You're not afraid of me. In my profanity, I'm so sorry. It is late and I apologize. How am I doing for time? Do I have any questions? Yes, sir. because it's easier to copy than to come up with your own original idea. I told you that lesson already. Yes, sir. Good question. Why is the Chinese hacker stock art the same as yours? Because it's easier just to copy it. They want to be like you. They do. But they can't. They cannot have freedom of expression. It's a bit of a duality. There it's endorsed in some cases as long as you don't do criminal acts. As long as you hack for the good of the country, you're fine. If you hack for the good of the country here, then you're probably not at this event or you're not going to admit it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Actually, correction, sir. I did not say that they say they're the best. They say you're the best. They do. They want to be like you. Yes. Have they come to CTFs here? Yes, they have. They'll mainly, they're only uh, granted authorization to go to like China, uh, sorry, uh, Japan, Tokyo, Malaysia, Indonesia, Jakarta, uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Taiwan, as I mentioned. Um, interestingly, I've seen them in Moscow, <laughs> and they share all their exploits and tools with the Russians, as they'll share them with the Iranians if you go to Amsterdam. It's hilarious. It's like a playground for hackers out there. It's funny. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Let me, let me, you already asked one, let me get you next. Yes, sir. Do you use water 
<laughs> Gentleman's question was, have I seen a higher uptick in uh, attacks specifically on water purification or other things given their dilemma in the environment there? Absolutely, absolutely. I think they're, they're reached a point now where the most dangerous uh, piece that I posit in this book here on the crap, uh, criminal enterprise is that they are now hacking each other. Because the hackers, once they've been retired from the military or a standalone enterprise, say, hey, you know what? I've got these skills and nobody's really watching me because the PLA's done with me because I think I'm not good at it anymore because I'm old. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my own hacking crew. I'm going to hack some of these guys. In fact, I've got pages of forums in here that you could join. The only problem is you have to speak Chinese. And they'll ask you to answer a question about what's the longest river in China. You need to know the answer to that and be able to answer it, much like a, you know, a check for a, a forum here, the Yangtze River. But you have to answer it in Chinese. You can't say the Yellow River, They'd like, oh, for a foreigner, go away. So yes, yeah. Good question. Yes, sir. So with the basic headlines of being three, four, five lines that are able to hand in things, you can't even spring by rules. How does it go ahead and make the balance between allowing these hackers that they have go through and do what they need to do? Yet still be able to constrain them to the point. Besides, we're going to say, well, I'm going to shoot you. At which point, they lose the hacker and the and the and the system they have. And that's a very good question. So, how do they control these hacker cadres? Very easily. It is much more banal than that. There, there is an escalation of uh, dismissal. If you don't hack for me, and I'm a Chinese military officer, first option is I'm going to send you and your family to ten pigs. And if you still don't want to hack after you come back from that. Uh, dismissive, disrespectful duty, then I'm going to do some more painful things to you. And the Chinese torture is unbelievable. Killing you, you want to be killed by that point. That's how they control it. This national security law that they've got makes it even more finite that they do not have hackers. They come right out and say it in English and in Chinese. And the national cybersecurity law puts a finer point on it and it says, if you as a foreigner hack inside there, we will arrest you and you're subject to Chinese laws now. And we don't have FBI officers demarched to, to Washington, D.C. I mean, the Gong Anbu, the MPS, like we do. They'll just come and get you. And that's probably the most sincere. Who's heard of the booksellers in Hong Kong that have been, been snatched lately? Crazy stuff. Have you also heard that the Chinese, and bear with me while I give you a long-winded answer here, the way they control it is the Chinese just make a decision, and if they say that your children can no longer read Hong Kong history under the British rule, you will now read that the Chinese actually own Hong Kong since it was formed. But how does, how do they the mindset? Well, you're Chinese. You're a nationalistic, patriotic hacker. You will do this for the country, won't you? Won't you? And yes, sir. Exactly. And that is the dilemma, is that that freedom of expression is something that is so dismissed and subverted that it's driving them nuts. And what has happened is you're seeing the economy starting to tank. More controls are being put in place. If you're a foreign magazine a publisher, for example, your stories cannot be on the Chinese Internet anymore because they're seen as subversive. So from a hacking perspective, you're under strict control. It's like giving all of you a weapon system and then not giving you any ammunition for it until I give it to you. I know your capabilities, but until I tell you to lock and load and fire on a particular target, I don't really want to hear from you. That's the way they deal with it. Awesome stuff. Any other questions? How am I doing for time, by the way? Well, what time is it now? 20 minutes? Holy crap. I sped through that. Must have been that coffee that I had on Delta. Holy crap. Yes, ma'am. Could you speak up just a little louder, please? That's utter bullshit. The young lady's question was, there have been Western cyber intelligence, whatever the hell that means, commercial companies that are saying 
that the cyber espionage and effect from China has diminished. I would say, show me, the, show me the evidence of that. I would say that it's actually accelerated. That same person that said that actually came out and said that it has increased if you watch the rags. So I know that was going to be your next question. Awesome question. By the way, um, <laughs> and I'm sorry I'm using the I word, I'm only me. I'm at RSA in San Francisco in 2012. And before I'm about to go on stage and give a brief similar to this, a fellow by the name of Baitlick calls me up on my cell phone and says, hey, Bill, can you, can you tell us what the PLA is saying about our APT1 report? And I looked at my phone and I thought, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, you guys just violated the PLA. How come you can't figure this stuff out? Well, well, I, I don't have those people on staff right now. I mean, can you help me out? It took me like 30 seconds on my frickin' iPhone to find it and send it to him. True story. Why would he be calling me? They would not even give me the time of day when I was there, so it's like, whatever, don't have time. I'm not in threat intelligence, by the way. Ugh. Other point, I'm in Warsaw. I'm in Warsaw at their Pulsert event. And I show this picture, and one of the, of the three hackers that I mentioned, and one of the, Wan Tao, I asked him in Chinese, so what do you think about this APT-1? And he's like, Bill, you've been in the military. Have you ever been in a posh area of New York as a Marine? Do you have posts or bases or stations in a highly populated area? And I said, no, we have it in the most decrepit, disgusting, remote locations because of the cost. He says, think about it, Bill. There may be telecommunications nodes, but there's no unit there. I repeated this in Warsaw. A young man, maybe 25, from Mandian, who gave the keynote, before I even finished my sentence, no shit, he stands up and he says, we agree with Hagestad. And I'm like, wow. I didn't even finish my sentence. So, go figure. Interesting. Yes, fascinating. All right, good question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I wish I could walk around with this mic. What's up with this technology full paw here? What the heck? Yes, sir. Good question. So the gentleman's question was, if the Chinese went to war against us, what would their capabilities be, kinetic or cyber? Cyber, that's why I asked you to Google Sinomac while I was talking they would essentially disable part of the grid. Maybe that would happen, not that that's ever happened, right? Maybe a branch falls on something and it looks like, you know, a part of the Northeast has fallen off. Well, what they would do is because they're carefully studying what has happened in the United States, they would select a pocket of urban development that has all kinds of issues, like LA, and isolate that with electrical warfare, like an EMP. They would then approach the government and say, you know what? We see you are having trouble maintaining law and order. We have the ability to land Chinese military aircraft in Idaho because we have an economic trade zone that you gave us back in about 2001 or so. 50 square hectares, is that going to be okay? We can put generators out there. We can maintain law and order. Look at your police, they can't maintain law and order. Your military's in Afghanistan, they can't possibly get back here in time. How would that be for you? Is there going to be the actual event of war, kinetic force on force? No. We're still too economically tied together. Culturally, we're their best friends. We always have been. If you look at World War II, we saved a lot of cities from the Japanese rape. So they, they remind they, with us, uh, regard us with high regard. Yes? <laughs> Operation Middle Kingdom. Operation Middle Kingdom. I was asked to remove that. Yep. Kryptonite. <laughs> good question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, good. More. Good. I like it. I wish I could walk around. Oh. What are your thoughts on how our national infrastructure is uh, significantly funded by the United States and how we can Base for the servers that were in open warfare, and they basically called their nets, refused to come 
<clears throat> yep, the gentleman's question was, our infrastructure is largely funded by the Chinese. I wouldn't agree with that 100%. It's probably more the Russians, so we should be wary of that. Um, actually, it's worse than that because the bond position that the Chinese maintain on U.S. bonds and uh, treasury certificates has decreased at its greatest rate since uh, beginning of 2015. They're selling it off. We're not a good credit risk for them. What is happening is the reciprocal effect in China. They're losing trading partners because there's just not the, the cross investment. Now, if you were from England, I would be rubbing your nose in it because Huawei runs their nuclear power plants their telecommunications infrastructure, and most of their intelligence organization communications. So they don't like it when I come over there. <laughs> then I ask them why Mel Gibson's got a heart on for him, but that's another story. Yes, sir? The gentleman's question was, so the United Kingdom and their infrastructure has got back doors that the Chinese are uh, exploiting. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, the, <laughs> the Chinese have already colonized the UK, so they don't need to use those back doors. They have. They have. I said that in Whitehall Street. I didn't like They almost threw me on an airplane and out of there. I kid you not. It's true. There's a uh, one trillion pound, I hope I'm not misstating on the figure, maybe one billion pound, Huawei R&D facility north of London that is creating a lot of jobs. They're very tight partners. Chinese are buying up real estate around London, which is no small feat if you've ever been there. It's very expensive. Besides the Arabs, why are Chinese buying stuff? Why? Because England's a better trading partner than the United States. So, sir, hopefully I backed into your question a little bit obtusely. We're not a good credit risk for the, for the Chinese. There was another question over here. Yes, sir. Mm, yes. The gentleman's question was in terms of hacking education and how are they developing? They're developing on a much more rapid scale than you can possibly imagine because they've got a very significant uh, program called the 863 and the 973 program. They are fo focused specifically on American companies by technology, by vertical in terms of the way that they want to focus it for cyber exfiltration of data. It's more finite than you can possibly imagine and it's all in Chinese. That's another briefing that I would give in another environment. Yeah, you guys would be blown away by that. You'd be going crying. Ooh, we wouldn't want that. Yes, sir. Just doing my duty, sir. But thank you. Yeah, I always wanted to be a Marine. My son's a Marine, actually, on Okinawa. Just picked up corporal. So there you go. Yeah. All right. Any? Yes, sir. Learn Chinese. Gentlemen's question was: What should the government be doing differently, or as companies? I would. Ladies and gentlemen, with all due respect, I've met some of the folks that are advising our president on China. None of them have been to China recently. They're telling them that China's the enemy, that we must beat them into submission. And then if you ask those same policy experts if they've ever served in the military, they say, well, no, that's for people like you to do that. So they don't really understand what the, the dynamics are. The only reason that I, I believe that I'm allowed to go back into China is because I actually had to get out of the Marine Corps for six months in 1983 to go there. So I'm not just somebody that picked up a headline and say I want to learn about China. I have a legacy and it's interesting because some of those same policy wonks don't have that, that I didn't see them at when I was at these, these Chinese military events. They're not being invited to these, these PLA think tanks because they're always saying that China is bad. Who heard of the World Internet Conference recently in Wuzhen? Did you go? I was frickin' there. Cyberspace of Administration of China paid my way to go there. It was interesting because there was nobody from the Five Eyes there. You know what the Five Eyes are, right? Nobody there. Guess who was there? The Russians, Ukrainians in a different room, all of the African countries, 
I'm not kidding. There was nobody official from America there at all. It was weird. The Chinese wanted to say to the rest of the world, this is now the Chinese internet and you need to play by our rules or don't bother applying. So to answer all of your questions and what the ch government should do is probably not be so much of a China basher, but also don't be afraid. But if you've never been in combat, you would never know that. Because then you'd scamper home and watch whatever it is you watch on TV. I don't mean that at you personally, sir, but that's kind of what's happening in DC. And by the way, if you got this thing called the election, oh God, Ugh. right? The Chinese are really wondering what's going to happen to us. Yeah, I didn't say that, but yes. Uh, Charlie Foxtrot, right? Roger that. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for such a Yes, sir. What government? Okay. Yes. Huawei, yep. Oh dear, that is a that's such a profound question that if it no, no, well, it is, but it isn't. But let me give you from field experience, it's much more effective. And if you read the Chinese newspapers going back four years now, there's this thing called the Golden Shield Project. It runs on Cisco gear, yes? What's the smart net contract on that worth per year? Billions, yes? When the Chinese government announced that they did not trust any Western technology and it needed to be removed from all Chinese government accounts, including the Great Firewall, I made a simple tweet. You hear that sucking sound in the barrier? That's Cisco going out of business. Next thing I know, I've got the CEO, the CIO, and the CTO following me on Twitter. How does he know this? The Chinese said we cannot trust any foreign technology because of the backdoor issue. This has been exacerbated after the trader that worked for Booz Allen came out and went to Hong Kong and then on to wherever he is, St. Petersburg. They now know, that's why the Chinese didn't take them. They don't like traders, by the way. And they said, wow, if all of this is coming out, we now know that the Americans, if they introduce any technology into our sovereign internet, it's probably got a back door and they can take a look at all of our stuff. We do not trust the Americans. So if you're in the banking industry, one second, sir. If you're in the banking industry here in the United States and you want to do business in China, you have to use Chinese servers manufactured by a company called Inspur in conjunction with a joint venture with IBM. IBM's very smart. They said, we will not export our servers, we'll build them for you under Chinese supervision. Note to self. Start studying Chinese, and then if you're going to go there for business, make sure you do it correctly. It can be done. Yes, sir. I can't comment. Sorry. Yes, the gentleman's question was, have I seen, after the, the Office of uh, Management, uh, whatever, at OMB, any of those records being uh, perhaps seen or used or violated or sold inside the People's Republic of China? And I said, I can't comment on that. Yes. I, I will tell you this, though. I mean, I got one of those letters, and I still went to China. You know, I mean, what the hell? <laughs> you know? What's that? Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, I got an email from my think tank this morning. They want to know about special operations because they're trying to figure out how to fight ISIS. They're very concerned about this. So there is hope. Let me, let, this gentleman first, then I'll get back to you, sir. Please. They already have. <clears throat> so the gentleman's question was, you've got Intel, you've got Microsoft, you've got Apple. Each one of those is an interesting case study. So briefly, Intel, they've, there's joint ventures all over the place. 
Intel has figured out how to do business inside China. Apple, former CEO, before he died, went and announced a $1 billion investment in Shanghai. So all of the OS and all of the systems are now being developed at an R&D facility in Shanghai. What was the last company? Microsoft? Microsoft, after they announced to all of us that they're not going to support Windows 7 anymore, they told the Chinese government, we will support it for you because we see such a huge market for it. I did, t I, there's so much that I could have shown you that I didn't, that I took out because of time. Shit, I could have done a whole eight hour workshop on this and still be going. <laughs> like the Energizer Bunny, I love this stuff. This gentleman, please. Yep. Is China going to actually try to use the ARPA board in a corporate fashion on that? I mean, take a look at the group around us here. And I'll bet you a lot of them run Nexus phones or Nexus this that are run by Hawaii or developed by ZTG or the Lenovo. Mm -hmm. How much is that now being spent in part of their plan to say, listen, we've got to go and this is now the United States is now on the board? It's much worse than that, sir. So if you go to a Walmart or a Sam's Club, the average person is able to buy a ZTE or a Xiaomi phone. And they don't care because it works great, it's cheap, they don't care that it's Chinese, it's like Japanese, right? I mean, that's the way the average American looks at it. They don't see it as a threat. They're not in the information assurance, security, hacking, or cyber business. It doesn't matter to them. That's your job, to go out there and educate them. So when you're having dinner tomorrow night or your kids ask you why you went to this hacker's event, you can tell them, because we don't want to use Chinese phones. That's not the point. To answer your question, yes, they've already thought about that. And they've, they've developed the economic and technical tentacles to far reach inside everybody's network already from a consumer perspective. Interestingly, Lenovo is banned on U.S. government systems. Networks, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Gentleman's question was, did the FBI ask the Chinese PLA if, how to hack the Apple iPhone in the case of the San Bernardino terrorists? Probably not. They don't speak Chinese. They don't. I, I, well, not that I know, but anyway. Yes, sir. <laughs> nah, there's no threat at all. <laughs> okay, let's take it even one more. I mean, that's a good point. So the gentleman's question was, supply chain threat and vulnerability from Apple systems that have manufactured chipsets in Taiwan with Chinese partners. I'm paraphrasing. It's much worse than that. So if you are in the United States, States Air Force, and you fly like a C-17 or a C-141 or a C-5, you're issued an iPad with Russian software running on a Chinese chip. It's much worse than that. Yes, good question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> because they are our largest trading partner. It's as simple as that. We can't resolve the, the dilemma which is economic trading partner versus the exfiltration of property. We just can't figure that out. And why that is, I don't know. If somebody asked me to write a book on that, I would, but it's like, really? You don't make any money selling books. Trust me on this. Two minutes, thank you. I'm almost done. I don't know. I don't know, go to D.C., sit in four hours of rush hour traffic, go to one of those think tanks and ask those guys whose blogs you see that are full of bullshit, ask them why they can't solve it. Oh, by the way, they're advising your president. Yes, sir. Last question, please.
discuss that. Oh, it's so easy to get the stack. You don't need to do money. You know, you know, like the gentleman's question was, do I see or have I experienced something along those lines? An over-reliance on signals intelligence versus human intelligence collection by the Chinese? <laughs> Again, it's much worse than that. Signals are very easy. I remember teaching Chinese professors English back in 1980. Since none of us speak Chinese, and a majority of them speak English, it's very easy for them to get into a company or to university out of the free exchange of information in order to work together. And there's the dilemma. I'm not saying a witch on look after every Chinese, but what I wonder then is how come you have people like the, the fellow that hid all the intellectual property for the stealth uh, bomber systems under his house in Hawaii? Why was he doing that? Was he insulating against bugs? Not in Hawaii. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. There's a monetary reason behind that. So it's a combination of signals and a combination of human. Absolutely. 88 Queensway Group researched that. And if you Google it quick enough while I'm still here, I'll answer your questions on that. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Shishinin. Woshwa wanla. Zai